All right. So welcome everybody to the official formal Cosmo local gathering for St. Petersburg, Florida for the 50th annual uh, Gene Gepser Society Conference. It's an honor to be throwing my hat into the organizing mix um, a little bit between this weekend and next weekend. Uh, next weekend, uh, there will be more actual um, presentations. I'm trying to just concretize uh, what the titles will be, but we're going to have Sam uh, Sam Hins talking about uh, communal reverie, and we'll see what else we want to organize for that last session. But um, for this one, I am very pleased to have Henry Andrews on with us. And uh, Henry, if you're not familiar already, um, a Gravesian scholar of Claire W. Graves. And in the recent month or so, really, um, I don't know, month, month and a half, we've been engaging in conversations. We've been talking about Claire Graves uh, because of the writing that uh, that Henry has been doing just in terms of really looking at graves in a different way um, on the subject of decolonization, on the subject of time and, uh, and uh, a less linear model of consciousness evolution. And there was a lot of really exciting overlaps, I felt, between Gepser and Claire Graves uh, through Henry's work. So I was very happy to him offer or invite you to participate in this year's Gepser conference. It felt very appropriate. So uh, after Henry presents, I'm going to be doing a, a brief reading of uh, an essay in the mut forthcoming mutations anthology called Mutations, Imagination, Futurability. And some of you have already heard that, but if you're here again, thank you for, for coming back again. Um, and uh, then we're going to be wrapping it up. So, so without further ado, I'm going to pass the microphone uh, over to Henry. Uh, welcome, Henry. It's an honor to have you here with the Gepser Conference and uh, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. It's an honor to be here. Um, let me do the share screen incantation and see if that, uh, see if that works here. Let's see, what is your buzz three slideshow? So far All so right. good. Does everyone see the uh, the first, the title slide? No, I have a weird. I believe we see ti uh, title um, card three. It just sort of highlighted on card three there. Uh, again, let's see here. All right. Sometimes things work and PowerPoint, PowerPoint. Uh, let's try this again. Now, do you see the, the first slide? Yes, there we go. Okay, great. Um, all right, so let me just move this little thing in the way up here. And all right. Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to my talk on Gravesian theory and this idea that I am currently calling the ways of being. Um, and let's see if you end up wanting to know more about the things that I talk about here. I have my website down at the uh, at the bottom uh, where you can find out more. Uh, so today we are going to start with a very brief overview of Gravesian theory, that being the emergent cyclical levels of existence, or otherwise known as eclat, uh, and spiral dynamics, um, which is a uh, which is the more well-known version. Uh, we're going to talk about how I constructed the ways of being, um, which started as a as a way to visualize Gravesian theory uh, to highlight things that I thought needed to be highlighted. And then we will go over the different ways and how they relate to Eclat. And we will talk a bit about how the ways might be put into practice. So um, let's talk about Eclat, Spiral Dynamics, and Ken Wilber's Aqual, because uh, I suspect many folks here are familiar with that. And the relationship among these can get a little confusing. So emergent cyclical theory uh, is a developmental theory uh, created by Claire W. Graves, who was a professor at Union College in upstate New York. It was intended to resolve gaps and conflicts in existing theories. There were a bunch of different developmental theories or theories of what a mature adult human was supposed to be like. Uh, Graves observed that they couldn't all be true simultaneously the way they were formulated, and yet they all seemed to be at least a little bit true. 
So he came up with various uh, various experiments to try and develop this theory out of the data that emerged from those experiments. Um, and you can read about those experiments and the data and how that was all constructed on the Wikipedia page for Eklat. Um, if I went into all of that, we would not get to anything else here today. Spiral Dynamics uh, is a streamlined form with some extensions uh, by Don Beck and Chris Cohen. It was designed to facilitate leadership consulting and consulting on business change management. So it is more practical oriented. It tends to look at more concrete examples and manifestations of the underlying emergent cyclical theory um, and it's accessible, which is why there are things like color coding. And then the aqual altitudes. Um, this is Ken Wilber's content free, and that's his term, uh, set of colors for correlating the developmental lines. So they're content free in that the individual colors don't inherently mean anything other than that they are a sequence of increasing altitude. And then those get correlated with spiral dynamics or with Cook Reuter or whoever else's um, system that Wilbur has integrated into, into Aqua, the all quadrants, all levels, lines, um, several other things, system. Um, so it's really not a recolored spiral dynamics, even though many people think about it like that and talk about it like that. Occasionally Wilbur talks about it like that, but sometimes he talks about it as something separate. It's really trying to do something different and it diverges at the upper levels, which don't correlate directly with graves. Uh, they are roughly derived from Sri Aurobindo, I believe. Um, and the altitudes lack the cyclic structure. They are a vertical ladder of altitudes, as you might guess from the name. Um, but these things are all similar in a way, and people sometimes talk about them interchangeably. Um, the important thing about emergent cyclical theory is the emergent and cyclical parts of it. Uh, the basic aspects here are the existential problems um, which are the things that we are dealing with in life, in our environment around us that we are trying to cope with to, to survive and thrive. Those problems drive the emergence of what Graves called different neurological coping systems. Spiral Dynamics calls these V memes for initially for value memes, but they're, they're broader than the concept of values. Uh, so this includes physical challenges to survival as well as social challenges within society, like how do we how do we thrive in a, as, as social creatures. Um, the neurological coping systems that emerge cycle in orientation. So they start as uh, I express myself to change the environment. Um, and these tend to be individualistic uh, uh, systems. Uh, and there are the I sacrifice myself to conform to environment. And these tend to be more collectivistic or communal. Uh, Graves chose the word sacrifice. Sometimes he used it just. I don't really like sacrifice as it gives it this negative weight to many people. Um, that's kind of a reflection of the, the individualistic nature of, of American society to really look at any constraint uh, as, a, as, as requiring a sacrifice. I like to look at, well, why is this, why did that automatically change? Okay. Um, I like to look at this as a um, uh, as generative and relational um, because those are even more generic concepts of what's going on here is individuals generate a bunch of different behavior and options and then as we flip the orientation we are looking in relation to each other about okay how do we bring things together how do we synthesize how do we reduce into the best thing um, and it's this back and forth polarity of we're going to diversify and generate and we're going to come back and relate that is the, the, the fundamental polarity in this cycle. So this is Graves' typical way of visualizing what's going on. You can see, okay, I must have said something weird because now the, uh, what is going on here? Um, okay, hold on. Slideshow, why is this, why is this automatically changing? I've never had that happen before. All right, try this again. 
So um, these, all right. I don't know what to do about this. Is there, Jeremy, you aren't clicking on the screen, are you? No, I think I, I'm not quite sure uh, how. I'm fairly clear about this, folks. Um, Maybe it's got a timer turned on. I, I, yeah, but but I've never turned on a timer, and I don't know how to turn on or off the timer. Does any setup show? Let's see here. Oh, here we go. Okay. Manually. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Play from current slide. Okay. Terribly sorry. Uh, edit that out in the recording. Yeah. I'm sure we'll do that. Okay. Anyway, uh, here we have, uh, there aren't any timings on this, so I don't know what it was even doing from that. So uh, I use these same colors, by the way, this sort of warm pink uh, for express individual generative and this cooler blue for uh, sacrifice collective, relational. These letters here are how Graves identified things. He identified the problems starting from A and the coping system starting from N. Uh, and then as you approached each new set of problems that caused a new coping system to emerge. So this plateau here would be AN. Then you run into the next set of problems and the next coping system. So this is BO, CP, DQ, et cetera. Um, these are really intuitive, aren't they? Uh, <laughs> they are very useful in that you can talk about, say, what happens if you have problem C, but you only have coping system O, and that's an imbalance. But um, people don't tend to automatically remember these letter pairs very easily. Uh, now, you'll notice on this graph that goes A and it goes up through F and keeps going G, H, and it keeps going linearly. Um, Graves eventually noticed that there was a thematic repetition after six stages. So GT had thematic similarities to AN, and we'll get into that. So he renamed that A prime, N prime, HU to BO, B prime, O prime. He also had this spiral diagram that showed up uh, in, in the Never Ending Quest, which is his main book that was published after his death. Uh, and it shows these pairs in these loops where the second loop is much larger than the first loop. The second loop is really about um, being, it's about abundance and, and thriving. The first loop is much more about surviving um, and scarcity. This spiral really showed to me this kind of, this thematic repetition and suggested more structure. And this was my starting point for thinking, I think there's a better way to visualize all of this and that's what eventually led me to this ways of being idea. Um, spiral dynamics tends to draw a spiral like this. Uh, they call the problems life conditions and they get more complex and they call the systems V means and they get more complex. So as you go up here, uh, you can handle more complex societies, more dynamic and complex societies. These labels on the side, um, I forget whose labels these are. Uh, they do kind of tie back to Wilbur's traditional and modern and postmodern and integral. Um, there are many variations on this sort of labeling. These are the standard Beck and Cohen colors. Um, Wilbur's aqua colors are different. As you can see here, um, ignore the bit about Hansi on the right that came from a different presentation. Um, Graves just talks about the alternation and the letter pairs. Beck and Cohen have these colors, beige, purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, turquoise, coral. Wilbur's aqua has this infrared, magenta, red, amber, orange, green, teal, turquoise, and then jumps to a third tier, which does not fit this six cycle spiral. Uh, and as I understand it, is very loosely derived from Sri Aurobindo with the supermind and overmind and that kind of thing. So really, the altitudes kind of go off in a different direction um, at that point. So I've been talking about these ways. How do I come up with that? What does that mean? So the goals I had, my first goal when I started looking at this about two years ago and didn't have any idea that this would turn into a different concept based on graves, was to just emphasize the cycles and the patterns in graves over the linear progression. 
And we will touch on the actual Gravesian states. I know I didn't go through all of what each of those colors are, but it's it's not incredibly important for what I want to emphasize here. And again, it's easy to look those things up on Wikipedia. So we will touch on what those are as I go through uh, the ways once they're constructed. So I want to emphasize these cycles and patterns over the linear progression. And part of that came from wondering about things such as uh, in Tyson Yunkaport's sand talk, he describes various indigenous cultures that are operating in things that in, in ways that seem very much like the second tier, the, the, that second loop, um, but they haven't gone through all the intermediate stages in a way that we would notice. So that, that struck me as, okay, there's something else going on here. Graves was working from a relatively limited sample because of the place and time where he was doing the work what else might happen if we look at different patterns and what might that show us. As far as how to apply it, I wanted to facilitate generative exploration, like what's an open-ended way of this that this can help us look at the world rather than the reductive assessment of like, okay, you're here and here and here. And this gets into Nora Bateson's, you know, provocative comment of stage theory is colonial BS. Um, and I was already kind of poking at that, but her post really provoked me to focus on that more. So I wanted to make this very difficult to abuse because you definitely see problems with spiral dynamics where people get dismissed for being first tier or the wrong stage near a higher stage. And one of the things about that is I wanted to have some simple concept names instead of relatively opaque things like FS or green, uh, which mean whatever the person who knows what's going on says they mean. So um, where I started was this individual collective polarity. That's that fundamental two cycle. And um, I, I started, I decided to take each loop and just flatten that into let's look at one loop at a time. So we have a disk. And then that leaves us three of each of these and so I made those triangles and flipped one of them. And now we have a, a cycle of six alternating between the individual and collective. Now, if you keep your eye on the center of this diagram as I move to the next one, you'll see I change it to this gradient here. I also changed around the edges to this generative relational that I talked about that I think is a the underlying dynamic that produces the human individual and collective orientations. This is because a lot of times when you are, if you are going in a kind of linear around the edge of the cycle thing, if you generate a bunch of options, then the next thing you do is you kind of build the next layer of complexity by relating those. We're not gonna get into that idea in, in depth, um, but that's why there's a gradient here. The first thing that showed up that really isn't in Gravesian theory directly um, is this idea that I now call the three centers. Uh, a friend pointed out that there was kind of an every third stage pattern. Um, and after a great deal of poking at it and talking at it and naming it many, many different things, I realized that this kind of maps to head, heart, and gut, which are, of course, concepts that show up in the traditions of many cultures worldwide. And this is where I get to like wanting basic intuitive concepts. Uh, individual and collective, everybody has an intuitive notion of what that means. Head, heart, and gut, you know, intellect, emotions, and intuition, your gut feel, uh, sensation. We might not all have exactly the same intuition for these ideas, but we all have an intuition for them and we could have a conversation about that. Um, and that was very important to me that there be ideas that people can talk about without having to know, having to dig into a whole lot of, of detail and jargon. Now that polarity shows up at many scales. Um, so one way that that happens is sort of the first three are more of an individual. And this is about like the individual differentiating from, you know, the, in Gebserian terms, there's the archaic and gradually you get to, I think it's in the mythic with, uh, he talks about Odysseus saying, am Odysseus and like the individual emerging as more of a, as, a, as more of a separate identity. I might be getting that a bit wrong. My Gavsarian knowledge is not expert. Um, 
But this first half is more about the individual. And then the second half is more about integrating relations and building more of a complex society. I don't always put those labels on the outside because it starts to make this diagram very complicated. Um, but this whole generative relational polarity you see at, at so many scales in so many different ways. Uh, I mean, right up to the entire universe, the Big Bang produces all these quarks and gluons and four fundamental forces that all separate out into these individual things. And ever since then, they have all been relating to each other and many things have emerged from that ultimately, including us. Um, so that's a generative relational at the scale of the entire everything. So putting these centers and polarities together, uh, producing six things around the edges here, this is what I call the six ways of being. So we come up with things like individual ways of sensing, feeling, and knowing, and collective ways of sensing, feeling, and knowing. Um, the reason they show up all in this order has to do with um, we're going to go through each of the each of the ways and what they look like, how they correlate to Grazian terms, and this will start making a little more sense. It was difficult to figure out how to arrange all of this without going over time, so we're just going to go through those at the same time. To line them up with Eclat and spiral dynamics, here you have the letters, so I started putting the the life condition letters in the little vertex here that lead to the system, which has the, the, the system letters up here at the, at the point of the star. Um, and yeah, you can see the, the colors around the edges. So you get the first tier colors in the inside here and the second tier colors that have been assigned around the outside. Um, yeah, so that's how they line up. And again, we will go through them in detail now. Oh, yes, and aqual altitudes do not fully line up because, again, you have this third tier that goes off in a different direction, and so they, they would not fit here. Um, they are similar, but not the, not the same. So now, a tour of the ways. So we start with individual ways of sensing, and this is about your felt sense of things, your intuition and proprioception, right, the idea of, like, where where are you in space or time or everything? And this proprioception can be extended, right? When you hold a tool, it feels like an extension of your body to some degree. Even when you are driving a car, you have a felt sense of where the edge of the car is. Um, you know, it's not part of your body. You don't actually feel something touching the outside of the car, but you have a notion of where it is. You can extend this neurological felt sense in a more conceptual way. Um, I'm sure we have all walked into a room where something was going on and felt the tension immediately. And we didn't think about it. We didn't intellectualize it. There wasn't an emotional feel yet. We we're just like, oh, something's, something's happening in here. Um, what's going on? And if we think about, if we extend that further, when you are interacting with a very complex system, you might get intuition through that. Um, and that is conceptually the same sort of, of felt gut sense of things that you are that we are talking about. And the, what makes this individual, even when we're feeling out into, into more people, more systems, is that we are talking about the individual doing the sensing and the individual having the agency to act. So if we correlate this back to Grazian theory, we're talking about AN or beige, uh, which is, is infrared in the, the Wilbur's altitudes. Um, this, when we're talking about this uh, specifically beige, we're talking more about Gebser's archaic structure aligns here. We're talking about just sensing into the body um, and and uh, responding to the signals of the body. And this is very much how Graves described beige. It's really about your periodic biological tensions. I need to eat, I need to sleep, that kind of thing. However, also living at individual ways of sensing is A prime, N prime, GT, or yellow, or aqua teal. Um, and this would be much more of the integral structure, of course. And here is where we are looking at this. This is the, that extended proprioception, that sensing into cultural 
into the culture, into systems of systems. Um, I meant to find the page numbers where I put Sand Talk example here, but somewhere in Sand Talk, uh, in the in the chapter on patterns, I believe there is a detailed description of how to function in a society that is very network oriented, that is very much about, uh, you know, when information comes to you, you steward that by passing it on to the people who need to know about it, and you. You pay attention to how you interact with people pairwise and how you interact with people in larger groups. And I think it's a very elegant and wonderful description of how yellow uh, in spiral dynamics would work and, 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 and really tying that into how it is a, a, an intuitive sense of how to, how to interact in these ways. Collective ways of knowing is the next one. Um, and we are talking here about relational knowledge among many people uh, and also with other beings, with nature. Um, uh, it is the, uh, is prioritizes sharing of knowledge um, and it respects relationships. So it is all about learning from what is and it is okay to not know things and that's expected and accepted. So if we look at this on a small scale, we are talking about Gravesian BO or purple or aqua magenta. Uh, this is where the magical structure, uh, this, this correlates with Gebser's magical structure. And particularly we're talking about oral histories and legends. And there's the, there's the, there's the sense to think about this as, oh, tribal tradition, shamans, yeah, yes, yes to all of that. But you know, if you if you work in a corporation and you have a team, you know that team has its own oral histories and legends, and you might not talk about it that way. But there's definitely this knowledge that isn't written down anywhere. And if you lose too many people off of a team, you have a real problem. Um, and also, you know, we talked about non-human things. There's local knowledge of land. I did find the page references for this one in Sand Talk. There's a great example of, of a student at this field trip who's looking out and is not participating the way he's supposed to be, but he, you know, Yonka Porta asks him like, okay, what's going, you know, what are you doing? And he's like, well, look at the, look at the oak trees over there and look at how the, the water currents are doing this out in the ocean and how the sand, it's all about, it's all about keeping sand on a beach. And he looks at this in this very systemic way that it all relies on this knowledge that he has from, from living in that land and from hearing from elders about what these different things in nature mean. And he basically explains why the problem they're trying to solve can't be solved. Um, and it's relational knowledge. Now, if we go to a larger scale and we talk about B prime, O prime, HU, turquoise, it's turquoise in both systems, but it's a different turquoise. Uh, so now we're back up into the integral structure again, and we're looking at things at more of a planetary scale. And again, not knowing uh, mystery and paradox are, are things that we're comfortable with here. This is why turquoise has the more mystical um, uh, feel to it, more spiritual feel, because we are kind of realizing how many things we don't know you know, at, at yellow, we're sensing into these things and we're acting on it, we're doing things. We're gonna make this system work better, work more smoothly. Um, uh, at turquoise, we're thinking, okay, we, there's, you know, we can't mess with everything and have it come out right. There's a lot of things we don't know. Just as in ages past, we had the magical view of our place in nature because we weren't, we didn't assume that we could understand everything in the natural world around us. We've since gone through other cycles as we'll talk about in a moment um, and thought that we could understand all of these things. And maybe we come back around and be like, okay, we can't understand everything. So we move back into more of a, of a comfort with not knowing. Individual ways of feeling. Um, so this is about expressing and channeling individual emotion. It's the motivational impulse. It's your fire and your heart. Uh, in Gravesian terms, we're talking about CP or red. It's also red in, in Wilbur. I think this is moving into the mythical structure. The correlations here are very vague and, and I might not be getting them right, but, but roughly speaking. Here we have emotional impulse driving behavior. 
So I'm trying to show with the emojis of like, yes, they're different emotions. You're just expressing those outwards as they come up. Um, it is an impulsive sort of thing. Uh, if it's not, if you have not worked on how to channel it instead. Um, and particularly in, in Gravesian Red, it is looked at as much as an impulsive, unrestrained thing. So there's a lot of domination and submission. Maybe you do that by force. Maybe you do that by charisma. It's not necessarily the warlord thing, but that is that is often what gets mentioned here. And that's an important part of this in the historical sweep of Gravesian theory. Um, but, and I'm not gonna jump up to try to explain Coral, which we don't really know in Gravesian theory, uh, but you can, um, the idea here being that ways of feeling can also scale out so that you can operate on a larger scale. Um, you can also, uh, you, you will learn to, to work with this more so that you're not necessarily impulse driven, but you are still working with your ways of feeling, but you work with them more in conjunction with other things. So collective ways of sensing, back to the gut. Um, so here's where, you know, instead of necessarily relying on your own individual gut sense, you're kind of externalizing that to culture or to the group or to the collective and looking to that for that kind of intuitive guidance. And you of course still have agency as an individual, but that agency is going to respect those collective signals a lot more when you're using collective ways of sensing. Um, so the structures of the collective, including like what institutions are present, affect the options for your action. And you're going to act through those and in ways that work with those or work against those if you're kind of rebelling against it. So this is the DQ or blue level in Gravesian theory. It's aqual amber. Uh, I think this is still a mythical structure. Um, and again, I mentioned institutions, roles, and rules. So these are the things that construct the gut of society, right? These, this is the thing that, that this is how, how society has, you know, like our guts automatically digest food. This is society's automatic systems to keep things flowing and moving and on track. Um, so the, that structure kind of defines where you can go. So I've got little constrained paths here. Um, all right, we've got law, we've got things like public health, pretty relevant right now, um, and religion, and I'm sure you can come up with other things there. Um, and then again, um, uh, this could become larger and larger scale, like we can look at things like how do different cultures relate to each other, uh, institutions that are kind of at a cultural scale, so we're, we're, we're developing those slowly with the United Nations and whatnot, and not really a global thing yet, but working on it. Individual ways of knowing is the fifth position around the cycle. So this is knowledge you have or, or acquire instead of prioritizing the relational aspect, you are prioritizing getting that yourself. Uh, it may be more destructive. You're looking at how things tick, you can take them apart. So this is ER or orange, um, we're definitely into the mental structure now. It's more of an acquire a bunch of knowledge. I've got little grabby hands coming out of his head. Um, <laughs> the, their head. Uh, and yeah, this can be more destructive. So you're going to dissect the frog and find out what happens as opposed to, you know, in the collective way of knowledge, you will just observe the frog in relations. And, and that doesn't mean you won't necessarily kill and eat the frog, but it's, it's, it's a different, it's a different way of interacting with the world and a different prioritization of the way the world is versus, okay, I need to learn this. So I'm going to do what happens, do what I need to do to learn what, what I want to learn. That's very analytical and rational. Uh, collective ways of feeling is the sixth and final position around the cycle. Although as you have gathered with the cycle, you can keep going around and around. Here we are prioritizing relational feeling. What are the emotions going on between ourselves and others? What are the emotions going on among others? So emotional condi conditions such as injustice really resonate here. So this is FS or green. Um, uh, and here, you know, I'm trying to show there's this network of these emotional bonds and we are kind of feeling that and 
what comes down into our heart and, and how we feel and, and react from that is based on what we are feeling in, in, in the emotional structures of others. Um, so empathy is strong, injustice resonates here. Um, uh, sorry if a loud horn just showed up. Um, what's going on out there? This is where, you know, Wilbur has the whole mean green thing. I don't, I'm not a fan. Um, there's a lot more going on here. And I think uh, this is where kind of some of the abuse gets in where you start dismissing any one of these six because of a particular thing. Now, Gebser of course talks about the deficient aspects of the mental structure. And I think that's a, a way of looking at parts of things that go too far. And of course, all of these in Graves also has the idea that each of these stages goes too far. And that's what tends to cause the problems that cause the emergence of the next stage. So there's a, there's a parallel there. Um, but I'm not really into demonizing any one of these or exalting them. Like none of them are better or worse than others. You need all of these things. And I think that's something that's clear when you're talking about head, heart, and gut, and individual and collective. Like you need all combinations of those things. Whereas if you're talking about abstract colors, that's not necessarily as clear. So last section, let's talk about applying the ways. Um, so using spiral dynamics, this is gonna get into like the, the, the abuse potential here um, and the colonialist aspect. Using spiral dynamics requires expert interpretation. So you start off with this whole person in some context and then you assess them through spiral dynamics. There's some you know, quiz, you select how much you agree or disagree with different statements, for example. And that's going to tell you how much you you how strong or 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 weak or anti you are with the different different stages. So a uh, person gets run through the spiral dynamics tornado, uh, comes out with this sort of sliced up map of a person. So you've definitely found things that are really in the person, but it's you've also sliced out bits and pieces to look at. But you tend to have a spiral wizard who is doing the consultation. Um, the spiral dynamics book actually does call them spiral wizards. I'm not making that up. Uh, so, um, the spiral wizard will, and if you, if you read the website of some of the consultants who do, who are really serious about this, they will talk about how, yeah, you don't just get this map. We will sit down and talk with you about how this fits with what you're doing, what you want to do. So there's a lot of mapping it back into context. So a good practitioner will do this very well. However, the practitioner leaves. Um, and once the expert leaves, then you, poof, you're kind of just this collapsed stack of colors. You know, if you're in, an, in a job situation and your boss has this, it's like, okay, well, you're really strong in red and really weak in orange, then like they might make decisions on that. Things might've changed. It might not be relevant. Uh, you might've changed, the situation has changed. This is where um, a lot of the colonial bullshit type of assessment came in and the, the idea of assessment is violence, right? That you are, could be, could end up pigeonholed into things. And yeah, if you use it correctly with an expert, you avoid that. But if you don't, it's really easy to get pigeonholed into things. You get assigned to mean green and therefore everything that you talk about is rejected, for example. So what I want with the ways is instead of being this assessment that slices up different aspects of you and puts that out as a map. I want them to be a supportive base of prompts, which is why I have persons standing on the diagram. And I mean this literally in that I wanna have a printout of this diagram and people actually stand on it and move from prompt to prompt around the edges of those six different positions so that there is a somatic aspect. So that when I say start by operating from the individual gut perspective and get in touch with your body and then move to collective head, uh, collective ways of knowing and think about, you know, what are your cultural myths and stories that you walk from one, you know, probably two steps, but still you move from one position to a next and you have a physically different perspective than you do uh, when you were answering the previous prompt. Um, there's not a specific set of prompts. I'm not going to list any out because depending on what you're actually talking about, the exact set of prompts might be different. Uh, but they always come back to individual, collective, head, heart, gut. They're always these intuitive ideas that you can figure out some way to apply, most likely. 
Uh, and you always have to pick a context. There is no, there's no universal assessment here. Uh, that's another important thing. Like this only exists in context. If you want to use the ways again with a different context, you figure out your prompts and you go through the prompts again and you walk around the, the, the circle as many times as you need to walk around it to, to sink into things. So you are the lens here, instead of being filtered through an assessment, um, the ways are filtered through you and you speak out whatever you need to say uh, out into the world and you get these free form results. And of course you can record them like we're recording this um, session right now, um, but it is very much a live thing that is in response to a particular moment in time and place. So there are different ways you can use this. The participant, the person who is going around responding to the prompts, that can be an individual person who is reflecting on themselves. You know, for example, they might be thinking about themselves in response to the current restrictions of the COVID pandemic, wherever they are, whenever they are, and like, how do they feel about that? Or are they, are, you know, are they feeling stressed because of how other people are acting? Then they might look for insight based on how you know, use the prompts of the ways to examine how they are thinking, feeling, and, and intuitively reacting to that. But you can also have a group go through, and that can be done many different ways. Each person can respond to the prompt and then all move to the next. Each person responds to the prompt, and you watch each other go through, and then you don't talk, you don't debate head to head, you just witness each other having insights. Um, that was something I wanted to to, to facilitate a lot is we have enough things where people people argue and debate. What I wanted to do was like, what if these prompts could help you uh, just understand each other by listening? Or you can have the whole group go through and discuss each prompt and then move to the next one, discuss that prompt and move to the next one. And the subject, you don't necessarily have to be reflecting on yourself. You can be reflecting on another person, on a group of people, on an entire culture. So you pick a topic. So we can, uh, the first time I tried this out was with a friend and we reflected on the topic of how the coronavirus restrictions and how the QAnon theory was, conspiracy theory was merging with that, both in, in my culture, the United States and in her culture in Germany and how we felt about those things and how we thought about those things and reacted to those things. Uh, it was a really, it was a really, it was a successful experiment. It was really um, brought up some great insights as we went around and tried out each prompt and got more complex as we went around the second time and built things up. You can also have a whole group look at each of these things. So it's parallel. Um, People always, you know, this, this is the question that comes up is like, okay, well, which way is this person really, or this concept or this task that I want to do? Like, which, which way applies to this? All of them, always. This is something that's really important and it's in Gravesian theory. Um, I have a whole set of slides that diagram this out. If we end up having time at the end, I can show that, that example. Uh, but, you know, as you develop each stage in Gravesian theory, they don't go away. You know, structures of consciousness also don't go away. Um, they may, you may emphasize different ones at different times. Structures can be latent, uh, but they don't go away. And as you move on, you will, in different contexts, you will draw on the different Gravesian stages and different combinations. And as you get farther along, you will be more comfortable with more of them. The idea being that at the integral, at the yellow stage, you, are, you become comfortable with the, the whole first six cycle. Um, so, uh, so in theory, all of those are present and people are operating from them in general. Uh, in practice, the way people talk about spiral dynamics, often you get assigned to a color. Uh, again, not the real practitioners who have studied this, but casual discussions, <clears throat> particularly on the internet. Um, uh, and of course, I have never fallen into that trap myself. Uh, <clears throat> yes, everybody, even people who are really, really grazing experts will talk about, will sort of use the color labels in ways that end up being fairly reductionist. So it's important to me that the ways, it's clear that they're always all present. Like you're never operating without your individual intellect or your collective 
intellect, right? These things are always operating at the same time in various levels of balance or imbalance, but they're always all there. Um, so it's more a question of what's the mix? How are you drawing on all six of these things? Uh, in Grazian theory, are you, are you drawing, you know, you can look at it at the kind of low level beige, I'm looking, I'm, I'm sensing into my body or high level yellow, I'm sensing out. But you can look at that whole continuum from the smallest scope to the largest scope. And you can start thinking about it that way for all six ways. And you can get away from this notion of, oh, that's first tier or that's second tier. And it's like, mm, no, let's not have this sharp division here. It's a continuum. And that's why I use the references in sand talk because a lot of times what Jan Caporta is talking about is something that is operating at a cultural scale. It's not the global species level universal scale that um, the second tier spiral dynamics focuses on, but it's definitely not the, the very, very um, individual focused scarcity oriented first tier. It's something in between. So all of these things have a variety of scales at which they may operate or, or, or through which you may operate them. I'm still working on the terminology here. Um, but that's the important thing. It's always all of them. So if we go back to our goals um, and check in on how we did with that, emphasizing cycles and pattern over linear progression, uh, clearly we've got this cyclic diagram. You can see it in the background there. Um, there is this Gravesian progression around clockwise around from the top. Uh, but you can think of things as, you know, again, going back to sand talk, some cultures maybe continued to develop the first two and some of the third and didn't really work on the, the second side, or maybe they just did a little bit of that. So it's not necessarily going, so, so when you look at a culture on that diagram, you can look at which areas are weighted and it doesn't require that you have gone around in the particular sequence. You can kind of, if you want to visualize a person or a culture, you can do it kind of as a blob in the center that is stronger in different areas, whether that fits the, the clockwise progression or not. Generative exploration rather than reductive assessment, that's where the prompts come in, prompting you with six different perspectives, maybe prompting you with six at a small scale, prompting you with six at a larger scale, however many times and ways you need to go around with it. Um, and it has to be in a particular context. Uh, there's no universal assessment. So um, that is how I think that we meet that, that goal as opposed to, okay, you have mapped on this test of phrases you agree with or disagree with. And then very difficult to abuse. Well, all of these things can be abused. Um, I, let's just admit that up front. But I think that the simple concept names you know, if someone goes and says, oh, you are doing all uh, collective, um, you know, collective ways of feeling and that's bad because blah. Well, you can talk about that and you can say, okay, well, let's, how, how, how am I responding to collective emotions and as opposed to what, what else would be happening? Uh, and, and because people have an intuitive notion of head, heart and gut and individual and collective, that's a conversation you can have. So people can try to abuse it, but at least there's a way you can start to engage from that. And that's that was my goal um, when it came to things like terminology and how we talk about things. And that is my core presentation for now. So I will stop sharing. How do we do a time? Perfect. I think just one minute over uh, the Q&A minute. point. Oh no! Wait, I have a I have a problem. Never mind. <laughs> My speaker went off. Oh, sure. One sec. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, yeah, we've got about fifteen minutes, fourteen minutes left for uh, some questions. So once Henry gets the uh, audio issue fixed, I would love to hear from uh, anyone who does have questions for for Henry. Um, it's it's quite a presentation, as as uh, some mutations participants already know, um, but. Uh, for folks who are familiar with Gepser, uh, the, the obvious, the readily obvious is the interesting ways in which um, the model can be used in a completely nonlinear way um, in which there's a different way to read everything, right? 
the nonlinearity of past, present, and future, everything being co-present. Um, and I think that the, if Henry can hear me yet, uh, there are the, the fail safes and the, and the checks in terms of abusing a particular model are, are really present in, in Henry's approach to a reading of graves. So I've really, really valued that Henry. Um, here we go. We got a question from Karen. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. I so resonate with this. Um, I, I love the way you're, um, uh, first of all, to uh, depathologize spiral dynamics, Gebser, Aqual. So, I mean, the, the issue that how these are used in unhelpful and even harmful ways by labeling. I mean, this, this is, this is a, a question. It isn't just in these particular typologies. Every time we use categories or assessments, and this is what the rational mind does. This yeah. is what the into human intellect does. It sees differences and makes categories, you know, but then how, how to have categories without abusing them. This goes all the way back to the dawn of the human intellect, I'm sure. I remember Jung, when he introduced his, his type, his typology, which is the basis of the Myers-Briggs typology, one of the most used personality inventories, Jung was constantly saying, be careful, be careful not to take any of our categories too rigidly. I mean, his own followers immediately started, yeah. you know, judging and assessing. And he was Agreed. always saying, Whoa. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. So this is this is a problem that is endemic in any categorization, especially when we're categorizing, categorizing each other. And I just want to applaud again your attempt to depathologize that and make a system that is as resistant to abuse as possible. And so now I immediately geek as I am. I want to tinker with it, your system, <laughs> because these all these all these systems align. I mean, with just a tiny tweak, I I, I could I could see how uh, Wilbur's Aqual system, even his for his second and third tiers, fit right in with a tiny tweak to Ken Wilbur's system, which is one of the things. If I ever had an hour of Ken Wilbur's time, one of the things <laughs> I would be talking. To, I, I would like to suggest you tweaking this here. <laughs> Um, I'll never, I'll probably never have the chance, but you know, it all aligns so well with only a few tweaks and I'll get to Gebser in a moment, but I also want to say that Piaget, Piaget's, I, I don't know if you want to call it typology, they align and, and Wilbur had a lot, you know, Wilbur put Piaget and Gebser together and that was part, kind of how we got started with Up From Eden, a book that has had terrific impact on how I understand the world. Um, but I wanted to bring this back around to Gebser because how I align Gebser with your view of spiral dynamics, which I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for introducing um, Graves' own system before it got published, because I only know it through the book, you know, Cowan and mm -hmm. so on. So I'm very grateful for your deepening my understanding of spiral dynamics. But I personally, as a cultural historian, I divide Gebser's mental era into three subdivisions. Uh, to me, and here's another a very important tweak I would make to Ken Wilbur. I, I go archaic, magic, mythic for that what they call red. Um, I think both systems use red for mm -hmm. that, you know, the barbarian, barbarian warlords. But then the next level up the traditional, that's the beginning of mental because, I mean, we are start coming on, you know, through Piaget. I, yeah, I wasn't sure I, about I, that one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's another place I need to, I, I really have to tweak Wilbur's system. But if you subdivide Gebser's mental into three subdivisions, you know, early mental would be the traditional, the great monotheisms of the world, the traditional where you obey authority, you know, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. And then the modern era, the scientific era, I make the, the uh, you call it high mental where we are consciously developing science rationality as an incredible cognitive tool. And then the green, you mean green mean, I call that late mental. I don't see it as deficient. I see it very much as a separate era, but Gebser was publishing his, his work, doing his work before the postmodern era existed. He kind, of, he kind of intuitively went all the way into the transcendent that, that uh, Algis was talking about earlier. And, but then there are all these, if you'd subdivide into stages, there are all these stages in between. Um, I think Gebser was talking to us from the top of the second tier. Uh, he, he went all the way around the spiral twice. And he was calling to, as I see it, 
Jeremy, and all of you Gebserians, mm -hmm. I see Gebs are calling to us from that transcendent point. And I very much align with how you have two go rounds around that six pointed circle. There's certainly, and you know, I see, I see green as the, if it's a deficient mode, it is the I don't breakdown. Think it's inherently but it's deficient, by the way. Pardon? pardon? <laughs> I, I don't think it's inherently deficient, by the way. I agree with you that it is, it is a later, there is also deficient mental and that interacts with green in some ways, but it's yeah. not inherently deficient. I didn't mean to imply that. Yeah, and, and this is, this is I think, Gebser's, where Gebser's terminology, where I would actually, with great trepidation, want to tweak that, because I think <laughs> every stage, every, every individual unit has its deficient mode, which is a way of defining, if, if, I, if I understand, that's the point at which the life conditions change and mm -hmm. necessitate, you know, basically evolve or die. Things get so dire, and we're in one of those stages now. Um, so for aligning Gebser with a lot of the, these, uh, these, these other systems, I would see if there's any inherent deficiency in green, it's kind of a breakdown of the whole first tier, mm -hmm. um, presaging the movie, because the second tier, I think that's a very big deal. And I love it. I mean, I, I resonate. I'm, I'm doing. The, I, I resonate so much with what you're doing here. I would love to continue tweaking particulars, but I think the insight that there are two go rounds, and that uh, the the second tier mirrors the first tier, but to put it spatially, like on a floor, like somebody when you presented it a few weeks ago, it's like a tw yeah, twister game. Literally on the floor. <laughs> Walk yeah, around that. And go around it however many times you need with different perspectives. And that's just second tier to me is just a particular amount of expanded yes. perspective. And it's a it's a continuum. It's not a we're here and then we're there. I mean, you can do that, but but there is a continuum there so that it's it does yes. not have to be this this big. I don't know. There's both a discontinuity and there is a there is a continuum. There's there's a continuity there. I haven't really yes. sorted all of that out. So yeah, yes. speaking. And we're and we're in all of them all the time, mm -hmm. to some degree, in varying yeah. degrees. And it and it mutate and it mutates from moment to moment to the degree we're in time. That so I like the idea of a blob. I think if your blob in the middle of the diagram as an amoeba. That's yes, a I, I, have a, I have one of those as one of the many variations of that diagram. So. <laughs> okay, so do you see this as something you could actually do as an exercise or as therapy to, to have that physically in a room and... Oh yeah, I mean, I have, I have tried this out with some folks. Um, I am talking with a, a community that I'm a part of that is uh -huh. grappling with anti-racism concepts, right? You know, the, the community as a whole is going in that direction, but there are people who are very upset about it. And um, we we're talking about using this to help explore some of some of that. Um, ha, ha, we have not actually acted on that yet, but hopefully soon. Um, awesome. So, so yeah, no, this is something that I am looking to put into practice very soon. Uh, I have been talking with people about it and it's, it's, a, it's, it's something that I see as a practical thing, so. Fantastic, and yeah, thank you, Karen, for, uh, for the probing and sharing and, uh, also, thank you, Henry. I'm really excited to see the application and see it in action. Uh, yeah. But yeah, we got another question from Jesse Shaw. Hey, Jesse, good to see you in here. Hey. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I, I came a little bit late to your um, presentation, but I, I just wanted to um, you know, appreciate and, and say, first off, I'm also really, really happy that you're taking that stance of not pathologizing people because they happen to fall into a specific, you know, quote unquote categorization. And, um, and just just a couple of thoughts, you know, which um, I and maybe I just, I don't, I really don't know spiral dynamics. I've, of course, heard of spiral dynamics, but don't really know it. Um, but was wondering, you know, in, in Gebser's work, and he talks about the various states of consciousness, and he speaks specifically to the idea that, you um, that we all, you know, that we all inherently contain all of them, but that we have a proclivity to go toward one or another. Like, you know, some of us are just like very mental. Some people, you know, they can't really think, but God, can they move and paint with colors, you mm -hmm. know? And, and some people are dreamers and oracles and visionaries. And, 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 you know, and his point was he was really looking that, that part of the manifestation of integrality for, 
each of us and societally as a whole was this idea that we understand where we fall amongst the states of consciousness so that we we kind of know what our natural thing is but then we work to try to develop those other states that are not quite as comfortable to our being and um so i so I, it, it's it's a it's a it's really a question i wasn't sure about the that integral aspect where um, you know you're really asking people to visit on your marking out of your thing, is there a place where they get to, um, you know, really like integrate their experience in each one of those as part of the process? Yeah. So there's a definite parallel between Gebser and Graves there in the in the sense of yes, with with Graves and spiral dynamics people do tend to gravitate toward, we talk about a center of gravity and there's mm -hmm. usually one level or, or two adjacent levels that people tend to, tend to be in the most, work, work for, operate from the most often. Um, mm -hmm. And then they will shift to other ones in different conditions. Um, mm -hmm. So for example, if you are playing sports, that's probably a different way of being in the world than it is if you are sitting down and analyzing something for your job, right? That's a, that's a more intellectual right, right, thing. Right. So you will draw on different ones there, but in general in the world, you will, you know, you will tend to operate from orange and green or something like that. Um, so that is, that is similar. And yet they are all also all um, present. For the integration, um, one thing that I noticed, so, you know, with Wilbur, things have gotten linearized both from Graves and from Gebser, uh, but but Gebser structures are not really a linear sequence. No. They they no. have tended to emerge in that order, but that is not because they are a sequence. They are, and then the integral you know structure is coming over to to bring them together. And right. and, and he presents it. And he presents it that way in kind of a sequential fashion because we are in mental consciousness. So that's kind of how we right. process information, you have right? To read this page yeah. and then this page. So you have to put right. something on them in that order. So that's kind of a limitation of how we are processing reality, indeed. Yanka yeah. um, Porto, when he talks about these uh, uh, indigenous um, knowledge systems, it's got four different things and then a pattern, four different minds, he calls them, but there's a pattern mm -hmm. mind that goes over all of them that is, that, that can integrate all, it's basically an integral thing. It can integrate all of them. It can, it can incorporate things that don't fit into each of the other four, um, mm -hmm. which are again, not a progression. They're just four different, different minds. Um, so both of those things made me look at this and like, with Graves, you get up to yellow and yellow is the integral and, and, and it's A prime, N prime. It's the first of the second cycle. And that's when you can work with all of the first tier, whereas the first tier stages don't like to work with each other. Um, and I, I, my feeling is that yellow is more of, it's the large scale um, um, individual way of sensing, individual gut. That integral aspect of it is a separate thing to me. Um, and so you see people who pretty, they are not demonstrating anything higher than say orange at that moment, let's say, but they can read, they can learn all of the, all of the different stages and they can actually work with different ones, even though they are theoretically first tier. So to mm -hmm. me, this idea of being able to integrate things, yes, it gets easier the farther along you go, but it's not associated with one stage. It's not just yellow the way, you know, or higher. Um, so to me, in terms of the application, you look at each of these six different ways and, and you, uh, the way I'm doing it currently, you do go around twice. Right, um, right. And then you would want to process that somehow afterwards. And I don't right. have anything particularly set for that. Um, one thing that I've talked about with people is, okay, do we want to set an intention at the beginning? Whereas maybe we are just listening to each other and then we disperse and do our own processing and then at some future point come back together. Or maybe there's a facilitator who after everybody has gone through and witnessed each other's statements, insights, then there's a facilitated discussion to integrate that with the group right there. I can see both of those things being useful. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's important to go ahead and, and proceed to talk about how they work together. They are not a partition. Um, mm -hmm. You will never be able to strictly fit everything into individual things. Uh, so I think keeping that integration going um, 
in the practice is really important. Yeah, that's, and you know, Carl Jung also talked about when you're trying to land something in the world to make it concrete, that you ritualize it in some way. So, yes. I mean, I love your idea of having somebody pull it together or like individual assignments of people going off and making a painting or, uh, you know, a soul box or, or whatever it is that they, they discovered. Um, yeah, I refer to I, it as a... Go ahead. Okay, as I, no, I refer to it as a conversational ritual. Um, and, yes, yes. and that particularly works well with this community I'm talking about. Actually, there's a, there's a woman in the community, Betty Ray, who's, who's been a part of it for a long, much longer than I have, who has a center for ritual design. And like that's, we've been talking about like how to bring this ritual into the, into the community because that's something that she looks at particularly. And I was like, oh great, that's, that's very exciting because that's how other things that I've done have been like interactive theater experiences that have a ritual component to yes. facilitate connection. Uh, my friend Scott Levkoff does yeah. this with a group called the Mystic Midway. And it's, a, it's another thing that's very influential in terms of how to, um, that people form connections and, and respond to invitations in a ritual sense much differently than if you're just like, all right, here's the instruction book, go. Right. And like, yeah, we're just up here. And, you know, the last thing I want to say, because I'm talking way too long, but is, you know, is check out the idea of the tetralemma, which is, I believe, an ancient Indian um, practice that still goes on where it literally is a marking out in space and there's four different quadrants. Oh, and, okay. you know, you step into one and it's, you know, it's this, it's this it's neither, it's both. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so like you're playing with those and then seeing what new manifests out of having stepped into those four places. And I just say it because, you know, you're talking about somatizing, having people walk through, and I'm, yeah. I'm just letting you know that it's got a long tradition. So it's, I think it's a really solid, great way to approach it personally. Great, thank yeah. you. If you, if you can- work. And you're doing great work. Thank you. If you can type that in the chat so I see the spelling, that would be, I right. sure no we would be happy to yeah and I think you can find it and then if you need to get in touch with me just let Jeremy know and I, I can give you more information thanks thank you fantastic yeah uh thank you Jesse and uh I know we're about five minutes over now and I'm going to try to do what what uh Dave did, uh, which is give the leniency of five minutes over or under um but try not to go too much further so just first of all thank you Henry it's been a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate your contributions and presence here. And I hope uh, the exploration between Gepser and Graves through through your work uh, continues um, and you find colleagues and peers here. Um, I also want to mention there will be kind of an open-ended time-free portion after uh, my reading in the yeah, sense that if we want to hang out, yeah, we can, we can continue to ask questions and explore together. So um, if that's good, then I'll just jump into the next phase. If everybody's good for that, or do we need a fiver or are we good? I know we've had a long day, so just check in. Um, no. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Henry. And, uh, let's jump to this reading.